All right, welcome everyone. Plan Weekly, what was it, May 13th? Uh, well, John. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I didn't have my name next to the item, but I have now. Um, yeah, welcome, Jake. Uh, Jake's going to be the new back end engineer manager for the project management team. Jake, do you want to say a few words, introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um, obviously, my name is Jake. I live uh, right outside DC on the east coast of the US. Um, I uh, most recently was uh, actually running an entire engineering team at a, a much smaller company. Um, so the company was about 120 people, the engineering team was about 40 people, and that was focused on uh, renewable energy, um, which was Really cool and really fun, but also extremely stressful and difficult. So I am excited to uh, have a slightly smaller in scope role here for a larger company. I think it's gonna be really, really good. Um, yeah, and uh, it's been an awesome three or two and a half days so far. Uh, the onboarding is is super unique and uh, and cool here. So um, I'm still like coping with some of the, uh, I guess the you know self-directed part of it it's difficult to uh like uh you were just saying it's difficult to feel productive i guess in some of those first days so um yeah overall really really stoked to be here and, and meet all y'all and, and start working with you cool awesome. very welcome over to you donald Thanks, John. yeah welcome all right one more introduction we have julian um it's very late there but please uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself, Julian. Yeah, um, it's only, well, thanks, Donald. It's only 1030. I'm, I'm just out of college. So um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Julian. Um, so Donald recommended that I just videotape my introduction. But since it's our first meeting, I insist that I do this in person. Again, my name is Julian. It's hard to pronounce. Um, I live just outside on the, uh, just on the outskirts of Seoul, South Korea but I went to college in the US in Michigan. Um, I returned two weeks ago. I studied computer science. In fact, I still have one more year to go to finish my master's. Um, I'm doing a sequential program, so that gives me both bachelor's and master's. Um, so how I ended up here. Um, I ended up here at GitLab um, because a GitLab member um, gave a talk about this company um, and its remote culture um, in Ann Arbor like I think it was last fall. Um, there was before this whole COVID-19 thing happened. Um, so I applied for the internship. And to be really honest with you, all of you, as I was with Donald, um, I initially applied for a back-end role just because I had slightly more experience in that. But um, I was offered to interview for the front-end role and I said yes, and here I am. Um, I think... Um, Front end seemed a bit daunting, just because it's um, where the um, where we meet end users directly, and as with everything human, it's just always difficult. Um, outside the work, um, I enjoy soccer. Um, also, what else? Um, skiing, big um, skier, and then I love books. So yeah, I'm really excited to be here, and I look forward to working with you all. Awesome, thank you. We are very excited to have you both. Um, and Mark, it's University of Michigan, right? Yes. Yeah, Ann yeah, Arbor with you, though. Yeah. Well, I'm from Michigan, actually. I grew up there. My wife went to MSU. I went to Michigan Tech. My mom went to U of M. So yeah, we have everything represented. So. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Thanks. All right, Keenan, you are up. Yeah, real quick, I just want to say, you know, we, we got the epic hierarchy and milestones out on the roadmap. Um, we kind of tighten down the bolts and clean up bugs. Um, and so I think that's just great. So congrats to the team. Please, please share my excitement and thanks for all the hard work that went into that. And, you know, that in conjunction with the progress indication we rolled out two releases ago is delivering the top three requested roadmap features. So that's one we should be quite excited about just since that's an area we kind of just started investing in heavily. So uh, just thanks for that. And the next point, uh, Alexis has done a ton of really good work on some on designs for Epic Swim Lanes on issue boards. So I would encourage everyone to 
check that out, provide feedback, ask questions, um, and start thinking about, you know, what that would mean for um, scoping an NBC from an engineering side. So, um, no, it looks like she added a YouTube video of how it works as well for, for those who are wanting a more real-time demo. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Uh, Marson, you on the call? Yeah, hi. So, um, so I've gone to, through uh, the uh, the issues uh, in the in the plan Kanban board um, that had the feature label and added a documentation label for those that I think makes sense uh, to have documentation that didn't have the label. Um, you know, if if you see that I did it in in a place that doesn't make any sense, uh, let me know. So I plan to do this kind of thing maybe once a month to you know, to stay on top of uh, what's happening. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I encourage every, everybody um, who's making front end code changes to to add the docs with the code if possible. But you know, if it's if, if the DMR is super complex, uh, then it makes sense to have it in a separate one. And hi to Julian and, uh, and Jake. My name is Martin. I am the the, the technical writer assigned to the plan stage. And that's me. John? Yeah, cool. Uh, so yeah, this has come up a couple of times now, and I'm not sure if we discussed it before, but I thought maybe we might want to consider running this meeting at alternate times on other weeks, uh, every other week. Um, and I wanted to gather some thoughts on it. Um, I've tried to do the maths. I've failed. Um, but I think if we were to, I think there's a way we could maybe run the meeting in a way that's friendly to people in APAC, but also includes some people uh, on the West Coast of America, or sorry, West Coast of the USA. Um, maybe somebody who's from the West Coast, if there are any on the call, could help me out with that and tell me if that's a realistic, uh, a realistic option. Um, I think Cormac and I are the, the token West Coasters, correct? Um, I'm, I'm happy to host it. Um, was there, did you look at a specific time, John, or? Uh, I don't think there are too many options. Well, um, we'd need to accommodate, I think, from UTC plus 8 to UTC plus 12, right? So, okay. um, yeah, whatever. I think that from having done the on-call agenda, I think the maximum we go back to is UTC minus 8. Would that be right? So whoever, like, is in the the working day there mm -hmm. and also like um like is that something could we at least trial it because i'm aware that we have a number of people on the team in the apac region who are excluded from this call by default uh, on a weekly basis and i think that's kind of unfair yeah it's a great idea should we start next week sounds good to I guess you who owns the the main invite you probably want to have a different owner for the alternate ones because i think gabe is currently the owner i don't think he necessarily wants to be trying to host it at midnight or something oh the, you gotta be you know, there are you kidding me <laughs> that's dedicated no i mean if it's outside of my hours i'm still game to come depending on the day of the week so yeah i think this is great the owner is uh, uh gitlab team meetings so i can go figure out how to change it well, yeah, I think anybody can change it. Uh, so just change it. Great. Yeah. Thanks, John. Cool. Cormac, you're up. Okay. So uh, just quickly uh, in marketing, if uh, you folks aren't aware, we've moved to a use case-based um, marketing approach uh, rather than a stage-based marketing approach. We're trying to market reasons people would buy um, GitLab. Uh, one of those is uh, Agile. There's some discussion about uh, exactly what that means. And I think it's a very healthy discussion because it's a discussion we haven't had before. I've started looking through the site and I've found some terrifying things that uh, need to be burned with fire. Um, we have not had a lot of consistency on the site in the past about um, how we've 
talked about Agile from a marketing perspective. So uh, we're going to be ripping things apart and consolidating them. And um, I'll be working with uh, the PMs, which I, I normally work, but I want to make sure everyone here has, because I know everyone here has very strong, very informed opinions. So um, I will be uh, linking MRs here in future meetings. And uh, if you have, if there's anything just burning desire to make sure that we do or don't talk about something in a certain way, uh, let me know. Um, but I, I do want to make sure that whatever we put up um, really supports and flows into um, what uh, Justin and team are, uh, are coming up with for the, the new vision. So that's all just a heads up. Uh, expect uh, some MRs in the future. Great timing. Uh, I have a question. So yeah. we, we're, we're working on adding iterations to the product, which are sprints. Uh, we initially called them sprints. Are they but, sprints though? But are they pause, always sprints? Yes, this is what this is the argument going on in emerge not argument discussion going on in merge request right now is um like there's some folks that are like just call them sprints but I'm saying like they're not not all sprints not all iterations are sprints because sprints specific to Scrum not everyone practices Scrum so calling them iterations iterations is more inclusive of all methodologies would you agree with that or not yeah plus plus one. I, I think I chimed in on that on that discussion, but yeah, or maybe it was just the Slack thread about it. So yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Okay, cool. I'm excited. Oh, I'll, the other thing too is, um, would it make sense that uh, we try to figure out how to align the use cases with our job stories or jobs to be done that we're working on for yes, I, I, category I, maturity? That, yeah, absolutely. Um, especially for, I mean, the use cases that haven't been, uh, we'll, we'll be, I mean, I'll be inviting you to the, the kickoff for the use cases as well. Um, but, but yeah, I think that uh, I've already talked to John Jeremiah about that and he's really excited about the jobs to be done too. Cool. Yeah, we have a open MR I'll tag you on that where we're moving it into like a data file. There's a YAML file now that has all the jobs to be done from across different stages. So that way you can include the partial in different pages and stuff. Um, so I don't know if that's, useful, but I'll ping you on it. So cool. Thank you. Love your input. Yeah. Uh, I think I have the next thing. Um, so historically what we've done is these groups within the plan stage is we have a shared uh, planning issue for each milestone or each release. Uh, and I think, you know, the different product managers dump things in there and then we can have some async conversations, but uh, to get the most bang for our buck, I think it's worth, and, and we're starting to have more overlapping things like swim lanes on boards, um, like real time is going to affect everything. We want to work on sticky headers, which should affect like epics and issues. Um, all that to say is like, there's some things that we want to focus on. So I think we wanted to do a little bit of synchronous, have a conversation around 13.1 release goals and talk through trade-offs, um, figure out how we can, move the ball forward with these various things that we have uh, in the air. I don't know, do you want to add any context to that, Keenan, Mark, Justin? That's great. Cool. Um, so I don't know how we want to do this because we've never done it before. Um, so <laughs> traditionally, uh, I think we can talk through the things that are already in flight. Um, I think from a project management group standpoint, we need to continue working on iterations. I think we're close to having the first pass of that done, um, at least the creation of an iteration and being able to assign an issue to an iteration is about done. But what the next step there would be reworking or adding an iteration report and then reusing that iteration report to backport to milestones to overhaul the milestone report view because there's a lot of cleanup there. Um, that over also like intertwines with the burn up chart, which we're going to have on milestone reports, but also on iteration reports too, because they're just two different kinds of time boxes. So there's like a lot of overlap there. Um, but I like, I look at that as like one bucket of work. Um, and then I don't know, do we want to stop and talk about each one or do we want to just run through a list and then go back and talk about them? How do we want to? Well, now I didn't know we were doing this. So now I'm trying to find my stuff to add to the list. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah. No, I mean, we should talk about it all because I think there's there's things where we can maybe consolidate and and this is where we can figure out how, like how we want to focus on moving these things forward. Um, yeah. While you do that, do we want to stop and talk about iterations and burn-up charts?
go for it. Um, okay, cool. So I will uh, open up and I'll share my screen right quick just so we can kind of see and I'll talk through the issue itself. Um, Not this one. Sorry, Zoom is being weird. Uh, but the basic issue is like the flow for creating is there, but I think the next thing to talk about is the little like the, the actual report chart. Um, and so this looks similar to like a, a milestone, how it looks now, but we're kind of cleaning things up a little bit, uh, consolidating, getting rid of the sidebar and moving the information into the, like the main view where you need it. So uh, we can have a little bit more context there. Um, the burn out and burn up charts are familiar. We're moving to percent complete over here, adding a day's remaining number there. And then some of the less used like edit buttons we're putting into like this kind of drop down. I don't know if we're gonna do the start, manual start at this point or not. Um, Cause it, it's based, like you said, a start date and end date and that's required. So I think that's already done. Um, and we'll kind of see, I think eventually we're gonna to move to making it even more automated, but still offering the ability to manually start it, going back and forth on that, but it's something we can iterate on. Uh, and then I think the report view uh, is a little bit different where we're trying out uh, kind of sort of a group by function where you can group by, this is like in, within a group milestone or a group, uh, iterations are at the group. So um, you can group by project and see percent complete for each one. Um, you can group by labels, by assignees or by epics eventually. So that way, like you, as you scroll through, I think we might want to make it so that users can pick which labels they want to group by here. That was some feedback we've gotten from showing this to customers. Um, filtering by assignees or grouping by assignees and then grouping by epics. Uh, and that will like kind of bring more context to what the issues belong to within the, like this kind of view. Um, this is where we're at, right? That we're still like showing this around and getting some feedback on, uh, you know, if it's the right direction. So some of these things are subject to change in this bottom area, but at the minimum we are going to have this burn down and burn up chart here. So like that's a known quantity. Um, and then you know, that's it. So, Thoughts, feedback about this, or and so sorry for clarity. So this is what you're thinking about building, like building into iterations next. Is this reporting kind of? Yeah, and yeah, and building this is a view app, but then backporting this into the milestones view, because um, right now the milestones view is not performant <laughs> by any means, especially at scale. Um, and you don't have a lot of these contextual like things that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've been doing like user research on milestones for a while now. And like we know we need to have more historically accurate milestone reports. So instead of just copying what's on a milestone and putting an iteration, we're taking the opposite approach of building something the right way with iteration since it's Greenfield and then backporting that to milestones. Cool. So. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I like, I like the the group by option, I feel like that gives, I don't know, just a lot of control. I like that. Cool. Hey, Gabe, does, uh, does, do any customers currently rely on the uh, burn down charts that we have at the minute that aren't like quote unquote historically accurate? So in other words, has, have any customers kind of built their workflows around this thing in such a way that they would be surprised if we were to revise how burn down charts work? uh they build their workflows around it but not really i think the the folks that uh know that it's not historically accurate don't use it <laughs> i'll put it that way um a lot of the, our customers they export all their issues and put it into a spreadsheet and build a report there so um that's like the main problem we're trying to solve with that is like we want people to use our reports and not spreadsheets <laughs> and every spreadsheet that i've seen is about the same and it has a correct burn down chart on it and a burned out or burn up chart and that sort of thing so um, I don't think they'll be surprised. And like the, the other thing is it, it's not our burnout charts aren't broken until you move all of your issues out of it. Right. So they work correctly until you're done with the milestone and then you move a bunch of things that didn't get done into the next milestone. And it shows that you're hundred percent complete when that's not actually what happened during that milestone. So I, I don't think it's not going to like break what they look at when they're in the milestone, it'll like change what it looks like afterwards, but that's fine. So.
Any other questions about this? Uh, real quick, Gabe. So it looks like for 13.1, we're going to focus on the individual um, iteration page, which I think is great. Uh, what are the plans on like the list view or the create um, iteration view? Are we planning on any um, on doing anything there in 13.1? Or are we hoping to get uh, user feedback before we before we touch those? What, what, like adding stuff to the filter bar and uh, adding it to like the showing iterations, like on the issue row or like well, so, issue card type thing or what? Yeah, I, yeah, um, something like that. Because right now, like the creation of iterations are essentially, it, it's fairly similar to the creation of milestones. Um, I mean, there are things like with requirements management where we have inline creation, which I think would be, um, would be nice. Just things like that, that I think we can um we can't approve upon just a general creation of of um objects within within gitlab yeah i think i would like to improve on that i think the thing that we need to get to is um as quickly as possible is showing a velocity over a number of previous milestones and then like improving everything else uh, like after that so the problem right now is that people want to be able to like assign issues to multiple milestones, which is a milestone and then an iteration, but then they also need to report on how like much they've completed that. But if there's places where we can make quick wins and improvements, I would love to discuss like what that looks like um, and how we get there. So do you have any specific suggestions or things that we should look at addressing in 13.1? No, I think, I think focusing on uh, iteration view in 13.1 is is good. Just looking at this, there's a decent amount of <laughs> there's a decent amount of updates we want to make to it. Um, so no, I think for 13.1 we should focus on this, and then once we start getting feedback on uh, some of the other views, uh, iteration views, then we can uh, decide how we want to uh, take those on. Yeah, we're gonna have to figure out what that looks like on a board um, because you can, you know, add, of course, like a milestone list. Should you be able to add an iteration list? There's like lots of things across the product that I think we should spend 13.1 figuring out um, while we work on this view. And then that way we at least have a good idea of how it should be. Because I think the issue, the boards need to change a little bit anyways, if we want to support epics and uh, swim lanes and all this other stuff. So. Like that's something we also have to figure out. Can you, can you break that down a little bit when you say like the boards need to change to support that? What do you mean? Like, well, like the, the underlying code and the, like how it's built, if we want to reuse the same construct, like it has to probably be refactored to support additional objects or however, like this goes back to the idea of having like the lists, like the, the list interaction model. Regardless of how you organize things in the list, you're going to have a little list with organized by some data attribute, right? Which is a board. And so I'm, that's all I'm saying is like, do we need to abstract some of the patterns out there to support epic boards in the future? Um, any other feedback about that? No feedback, no input. Okay. Uh, the next thing, <clears throat> there's a UX OKR for improving lovability of issues or like the plan stage as a whole, basically. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do was fixing the select and search inputs uh, across the, the, pro the product, basically any planning object. So if you want to move an issue, it's hard to do that. If you want to select a, the right project when you're creating an issue in an epic it only loads 20 um it basically only loads 20 results and sometimes that's not the project that you want um so there's like a bunch of problem areas that we identified that we need to prove from ux standpoint and we're going to try to figure out how to do that um questions about this uh can we include performance issues in this as well because i think um the issue show page has been identified as kind of one of the less well-performing parts of the site. Um, and maybe we could combine that as well. 
because you know like if like performance things kind of map to uh, customer value as well i guess if something is not performant and can't be used or won't be used um it's not very valuable so should we include performance things in this as well 100 <laughs> percent. so this is one of the things that is uh i've noticed about having disparate okrs where ux has okrs and it, about like quality like improved ux and then engineering has okrs about performance and then product has okrs about uh adoption and other things like that like they're competing and we need to figure out how to like make them all line up. And I think that's a great suggestion. So uh, do you have a list of items that we need to focus on? Cause I would love to add it to this or do you want to add them to this table? And this, I will get you a list and I will add it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That'd be cool. Can we, um, can we maybe add them as a second table or differentiate them somehow from thanks. Sure. Or you can send them to me and I'm happy to do it as well either way. But I do agree that performance and if issues are loading slowly, which they do sometimes, that's going to make things not lovable too. And that was a lot of the feedback from the MPS and Zest scores was that uh, the U UI is sluggish and slow. And I think that's the sort of thing that they're referring to. So um, we saw the working group going for real time to get web sockets working. Um, I think Heinrich's doing a great job there. I think we're getting really close to having the, uh, let's see, the, the assignees working. Um, there's just a couple items left here. So uh, the front end for this first one's done. Um, what's the, John, right quick, what's the exit criteria? Is it getting the whole sidebar working in real time or is it getting a couple fields working at scale where we're actually publishing like the the results back via like a pub sub instead of just like a boolean that yeah so the like technically the exit criteria for the working group is to um there are two of them one is to get ship the first working feature to self-hosted customers and one is to uh, ship uh, the first working feature on .com those are different in terms of the one on .com will be done through containerization and kubernetes the one that's shipped to self-hosted customers will work through omnibus um, in both cases uh, the omnibus work is quote unquote done the containerization is also in review um, and you can actually pull down the latest uh, the latest versions of uh, master on both those projects actually not master on containers but if you pull down the branch you can do it and you can enable the feature flag and you can see the feature working so the next step for us there might be to deploy the omnibus version to staging and switch the feature flag on and then we can actually use it in staging so yeah we're we're going at a healthy clip like i mean um we're, we'll be blocked on the kubernetes work but we can certainly pick up parts of that as a team as well and um, just be available to keep it unblocked when the delivery team get a chance to work on it. Cool. Thanks. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, the second iteration of the JIRA importer. Uh, I think the big things here is getting the parser working for the description and then uh, getting the user mapping working so we can import comments, assignees, reporters. Um, there are a couple other small fields that I think are worth getting done if we can like um you know mapping story points to weight which is pretty straightforward um you know like uh, uh the other one labels like if a if a gear issue has labels we should m bring the labels over and then i think um at some point soon ish once we get a few of these things done especially like the parser and the user mapping are a little bit forward I think we're going to try to talk with the importer group to see if we can have them take over ongoing iterations of the JIRA importer. Um, there, I proposed that yesterday when I was doing Opportunity Canvas review, and I need to talk to Harris to see if, like, how that will work. But um, there's some other things that I think are more important for us to, as a team collective stage, to focus on. Um, and we already have an importers group that's responsible for importers, so it's kind of logical but uh, I'll keep everyone updated on the ongoing discussions about that. Um, Keenan, do you want to talk through some of the portfolio stuff? 
Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, for, for, for me, I think it's so surprised I'm super passionate and kind of borderline angsty about moving forward with swim lanes. Um, like not only is that just like the top internal requests that we have, um, for portfolio management. It's also now our top customer request for the group. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I need to move it forward. We need to move it forward. <laughs> and so I would love to find how we can start taking steps in that direction. Um, of course, I think Alexis has already moved a lot of the big rocks through the design phase. Um, so I think we're, we're moving forward, but I want to make sure we're talking about it and have a plan forward. Um, that's a little more tactical. Um, and then on top of that, you know, uh, We've talked to, I've talked to Donald and brought this up before, you know, the idea of actually providing more robust filtering on the roadmap so users can actually craft and customize the view they're looking for now that we've put more information on it. Um, and, uh, you know, from an internal use case and, you know, with the health status feature we rolled out last release, um, being able to surface that through filtering or searching on the issue list as well as on the issue board. Um, so those are the three top items on my end. But I know we keep we keep discussing the need for boards to be refactored or updated before we make major changes. Like I guess I'm still trying to understand what the balance is we can strike um, towards moving swim lanes forward, um, but not creating, not digging us a hole that we're gonna have a hard time getting out of. If that makes sense. Let's do it. Because <laughs> we, I, yes, we need to refactor the boards, but I don't want to just spend a few more milestones doing backstage refactors of the boards. I want us to tie it to a, um, a feature that we can, like as we're building out swim lanes, let's do some of the refactoring, let's move some of the things we need to to GraphQL. Um, but I think we run into uh, times where, um, you know, we say we're going to refactor something and then we um, just end up taking a few milestones to just do the backstage and we don't really have any a whole lot of actual tangible customer value um, to show from that stuff. And I want to mm -hmm. do that as minimal as possible. Um, so we've been kind of looking for a large feature to take on um, on boards to help move the refactor along. Um, and I think swim wings is, is great. Yeah, I've, uh, doing it with while we're building a feature is the right way to do it. So I, like, I just want to make sure that since people rotate in and out of features, like that there's an overall vision for what what the end state of refactoring looks like so that it can be more extensible. Because like in the future, we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but there's gonna be epic boards, right? Which hopefully we can reuse some of the same like code for that um, and apply it to a different object. Um, so. It, yes. Is there? Are there going to be Epic boards if we have Epic swim lanes? Yeah. Yes. So the Epic program board hits a different use case that you see at like scaled agile shops or larger enterprises where they actually have a separate workflow for Epics prior to an actual development process starting. Um, so yes, that that is the next big tent pole item after swim lanes, at least from my end, would be Epic boards. And also, uh, there's a growing desire to have merge request boards. Uh, so like when I think about, um, interaction models, like th this, where I've, I've kind of talked about this before, but like you have a list, right? A list of things that are next to each other. That you can move items into that sliced by some core sort of common data attribute that is what is in the list. And this swim lane is basically slicing it by another data attribute. It's almost like a pivot table. Uh, and the same interaction model applies to epics when you're playing at the epic level, it applies to issues. It applies to merge requests. It probably applies to other things like, who knows, incidents. Uh, requirements. Requirements. And so that's where the, the kind of thing that we've been talking about in product is like, how, can we take the, that interaction model and create a common pattern and a common set of like uh, UX interactions that you can then just overlay different objects into this interaction model. So it's a common, consistent, reusable, and we're building one thing instead of like 10 different disparate features, right? That all like have different code bases and everything. So I don't know. Yeah, so similar to what we do for list view, just of course more complex and a little bit more complex interactions. Um, yes. 
I can walk through some of the bigger changes I'm seeing within boards um, yeah. with swim lanes. Let's do it. Let me do it. It's a little early here, y'all, so bear with me. Um, yeah, I tried to keep changes fairly minimal for MVC. I didn't want us to have to like overhaul right away. So um, the latest iteration here, I feel like we say iteration a lot, would be pretty similar to, actually to the milestone view, just grouping these issues in a different way. So for MVC, that would be epics, right? So I go in here, I group my issues by epic. I then see these epic swim lanes. Um, the biggest change here, because we are adding that dimension of um, rows, kind of like Gabe said, a, a pivot table almost, um, scrolling within each individual list is just like not usable. So you would have to scroll the entire board in this view. So that's a pretty big change um, that I really couldn't get around. And the other larger change here would be collapsing lists. Um, currently, we show information in that collapse state. So we both see that, that column in a minimized state and we see information about the column in a minimized state. But now we have these titles here that could get fairly large. So thinking about how to show that information still, if it's still needed, um, tried to play around with that. It could be some kind of just an indication that there's more information on that collapse column, maybe a user can hover to view more information. So that's that's another larger change there. And then the other things are not quite, you know, they're more added value, like, you know, collapsing swim lanes. Um, I can also now hide the open and closed columns. So I move the hide labels uh, toggle into this edit board modal. Um, and we could talk about that, but I'm assuming users aren't toggling that on and off constantly. So I think it would be acceptable for that to be in the edit board um, area. And then it allows us to group this with other configuration options. So if the user goes in here and hides the open and close list, that really zoom, it zooms into um, the list they care about and the issues they care about. So this, this helps us get around that problem of having an open list with, you know, 600 issues in it. <laughs> and uh, you know, 200 epics attached to those issues, which would then cause 200 epic swim lanes to appear on the board. So a combination of that and better scoping of the board would be helpful. And then in this view, users can also view this with without epics swim lanes um, applied. So that's that in a nutshell. I think the main things would be the behavior of the board on scroll and collapsing of lists, as well as how we will drag things around. Um, with the swim lanes in place, especially uh, with dragging the swim lanes themselves. I think for MVC, we would not allow that or any reordering of the swim lanes. Um, dragging of the columns, I, I said that could be a little strange. So when we work on that, we definitely have to like care closely on implementing that to make sure it's usable. Um, but I did open the issue around drag and drop. So I'll be working with the foundations team and 13.1 to work on that. So um, that's, that is swim lanes. Those are the main changes. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Let's what are questions? <laughs> I know, yeah, I'm throwing a lot at y'all. No, that, that's that's wonderful. Um, I think it's a great next step. The only other, the other low hanging fruit on boards that I've heard a lot of complaints about is that the way you scope the board when you edit it is not the same as the filter bar and you can't do things like not filtering when you're trying to scope your board permanently. So I don't know if there's like a way to like just only have one way to scope your board and that's using like a filter bar that you can then save that scope to your configuration so you don't always see it. But I, I don't know the best way to solve it, but that's another big well, complaint. I mean, the way I always kind of think about it, or at least the way it makes sense in my brain is that the configuration of the board needs to be fairly robust and do and support everything you can do in the current, in the filter bar. But the filter yes. bar in and of itself doesn't need to go away and actually gives the user an opportunity to do a quick refinement if they're just trying to discover something or clarify something or display something. So like, yes, I think we've, we've, tr we've trained people to use the filter bar as a second layer of configuration rather than what I think it should be intended for, which is like, I need to make a fast tweak that isn't permanent so I can get a better view to take a screenshot or share on a presentation or whatever. 
yeah, it's almost like being able to save uh save like if you run a search in the filter bar saving that to is like a preset that then you could also have another like filter at the same time on top of that existing preset or something i was gonna say it's um, like the quick filters in jira boards right like you're able to yeah. save it as a thing and then you can click it on and off as you want cool anything particularly risky or scary about what i just showed I guess I'm most interested in how we break this down and iterate on it, both epic swim lanes and then this broader sort of refactor in the direction of having more extensible boards. So I don't know when we're going to do that, but that's interesting to me and how we stage that work and how we plan that out over the next couple, couple milestones or whatever it takes. Yeah. I think the other thing that I noticed just about that, I agreed with the, uh, the locking scroll for everything when you're, you know, um, that will have potential performance implications we should think about because right now we uh, pat do infinite scroll pagination per list. And so we would basically have to load all lists on scroll, which I don't know what that will do or if that's a performance problem, but that's just one thing that came to mind when looking at it. Are we planning on locking scrolling to everything for all views or just for the group view like view with swim lanes i'd say we could do either um i'll probably i'd like to better understand the use case of scrolling by lists versus by the entire board um we could do both to make it consistent if there is not a really great use case for each individual list, um, or we well, can start some lines. Let's ask a question here. Was anybody here yeah. when that decision was made? <laughs> I don't know. No, but the obvious problem with it on the issue boards is if you have the open on there, you'll have something like 2,000 issues in the open, which means your page will be 2,000 issues long which is wasted space on that page. It makes sense in the swim lanes view entirely, and I fully support that, but when you're talking about the actual issues view, the pagination by column is actually quite nice because then you don't get this incredibly long, useless page. Well, I've got a lot of feedback that people don't want to see the open and close <laughs> yeah, same. on the boards. That's, so. that's why Alexis has had, did you, I'm sorry, I, you showed, did you show that in the YouTube video? I'm going to miss yeah, that. Yeah, and I showed it just now. It's, I mean, we've had the work around that from the Epic perspective too, because those open issues are pulling in Epic swim lanes into the board that potentially users don't care about. So Mark, the proposal now is that users can go into the edit board configuration and hide the open and close list. No, I saw that. As long as we allow them the option to turn it on, we have the option or that we have the problem with this giant page. If we remove the option entirely, which I am very okay with because I think they're dumb in the board view, but that's a whole other discussion. As long as we give them the option to turn it on though, we're going to face the problem of having the 2000 issues in a row. Yeah, I, th I think that's okay though. Like I'd imagine people are working more on a, um, on a column at a time. Like I can see the value in having uh, each column have their own scroll if you really need to see what is in the next column as you're working on the initial column. Um, because then you can go to the bottom of the list in the first column and you can still see that stuff in the second column. I feel like there's not a lot of people that work like, or there's not a lot of users that work like that. Like, do they really care about what's in other columns when they're focused on a single column? Can I play the devil's advocate for a moment here? I mean, the way the PMs are using these issue boards is we prioritize things in each column, right? So if I have a column with 15 things in it and I need to move it to the top of the other column, I need to scroll to the top of that one and the bottom of this one because I need to go from the bottom to the top. So what this will force us to do is if we get rid of that, individual scrolling is drag to the next column and then drag it up five, scroll up, drag it up five, scroll up, drag it up. Like it, it makes the experience pretty painful. Yeah, but so maybe through. that just means when something is dropped into a column, it should be put on the top of the list as opposed to the bottom of the list. Well, That's something uh, I think we should research. 
Yeah, the other thing that I want to add is the ability to uh, like hotkey or right click and move a card to any list in any position in the list via the UI. So Trello does this nicely. So like if I, I basically can right click or use a hotkey and click move. And then I basically can say which list and in which position that list, which is a number. Um, and that way, like if I'm way down somewhere else, I don't want to move it up. This is like feedback that we've gotten that people hate about Jira is you can't do that. The backlog view we've gotten feedback about that and GitLab is you can't like, you can't see the relative order of everything. Like that's not apparent. Um, but then you also can't quickly change that value if you want manually without drag and drop. So that could be another way. Just things to think about. I mean, I, I'm all for getting rid of the individual scrolling, but we just need to make sure that we're taking it into account how people are using it. Cool. Looks great. Uh, Mark, you want to talk through any of the, unless anyone else wants to talk about any other portfolio management stuff? No, I didn't realize we were putting them in the agenda. So I actually went and updated the issue to have the proposed theme for certify, which is effectively just trying to figure out how to get the quality of life improvements in. We have a lot of ongoing work there and I'm trying to sort of use this as a, as a milestone to kind of finalize some of that. So like for requirements management, we've got the trace between requirements and tests is ongoing work. I'd like to try to sort of nail that down in 13.1 if at all possible. Um, from a service desk perspective, we've been working on the private comments on com commentable resources. This has grown into a company-wide change, which is fantastic. Uh, it's a great input into what things are going on here. Um, but any com commentable resource now you can put private comments on. So I'd like to try to get through some of that work and finalize that. Uh, we also are continuing to work on formalizing the designs for adding email participants. I know this has been ongoing and Nick has done a great job. Uh, sort of doing the design work on that. He's been getting a lot of feedback from lots of different people trying to kind of figure out the best way to go about this. Um, it's both performant, um, secure, and meets the needs of the users. And then the other one is blocking issues. This isn't actually a certified category. I, I just sort of owned it by association. It's more of a overall plan category since it's more issues. Um, but it seems like we're getting a lot of great feedback on it. So uh, we're still working on the sorting issues by the number of items are blocking. I know there's uh, multiple. It's been broken down nicely now, thanks to, I believe, John did that work. Uh, we've moved some things into 13.0, but I don't think it'll complete until 13.1. So that's sort of on the list to finish up. And then the final thing I had proposed was the tracking interactions with blocking issues, which is another snowplow or snowflake. I, we've got to figure out how to do it. But effectively, we want to make sure that these are being used and understand their use because as a stage, I don't want to spend a ton of time um, adding more features to this if we're finding that they're not being used. I suspect they are. We've used them greatly internally to great success. So, I mean, internally, I really like them, but that's not enough of a justification to keep spending lots and lots of time on them. So with this, we'll be able to track that and understand better how people are using them and understand better how to prioritize additional work on the blocking issues. So that was my proposal. Uh, again, you know, feel free to make comments on that. I'm not wedded to this in any means. Uh, but that was sort of my first put on this. So, cool. Um, have we gotten any feedback yet on requirements management from users? I have gotten some excellent feedback from um, a lot of TAMs and SAs. I actually was on a call this morning with a TAM who said that since we released requirements management in 1210, he has had four customers who had never talked about it before call him and immediately ask when we're going to be doing more on it because they very much are interested. So we have spurned interest by releasing something, which is fantastic. I think a lot of people never asked for it because they never thought of integrating it into their DevOps tool chain because it never has been before in a meaningful way. Now that they hear we're going down this road, there's been a lot of interest there, which is fantastic. Um, I also had another call with a, a set of sales people last week in the sales side who are saying they've got a lot of interest in the federal sector right now and they're trying to figure out a timeline and they'd like us to put together sort of a, a roadmap. So I'm working on that for them so they can better um, status their customers. So there has been a lot of interest. The people who've used it have agreed that it's very minimal, but the fact that it's out there at all has shown and spurned a great deal of, of discussions.
And Mark, you would would you say that like traceability is the biggest thing that will help drive adoption? It sounds like there's some interest, which is great, but in terms of adoption and customers using it, is traceability the big thing? This is such a hard category because there's really two distinct user groups. There's the regulated industries and then there's everyone else. For the regulated industries, until we offer trace, they can't really adopt. So yes, that's a major factor for them adopting. For everyone else, actually, Nick is doing a really great job on a research um, sort of work right now, trying to understand how people view it and how they'd like to proceed forward. And the responses we're getting there is they want to be able to comment and discuss requirements internally. So it looks like, and I'll let him summarize his findings entirely when he's done with all the interviews, but it looks like there's actually a couple of things like labels and discussions on requirements that seem to kind of bubble to the top for the non-regulated industries uh, as they can adopt much sooner and they're looking more for future features or to expand the feature set in different ways. So it's kind of a hard balance. Uh, we can easily collect data on the non-regulated. The regulated people generally are in their own instances and do not allow metrics tracking for specific reasons. So it's much harder to get data on them, but I have to trust more the essays and the TAMs the, to sort of provide that input. One question is, is it like, because I've run into this when I've talked to customers who uh, they think GitLab doesn't do, de can't do defect tracking right? So you can't add a defector, which is just an issue, we, we call it, uh, or that um, we don't have user stories, right? Is, is it the case where sometimes folks are thinking that requirements are a different name for what we call issues to a certain degree? I have received that a lot. I think people don't correct. Generally speaking, the SaaS world doesn't think of requirements at all like the regulated world, which is why we're trying to kind of bridge this gap. The, the work is similar, even in like the world we're in right now, we have user stories and we want to write issues and epics to fulfill the user stories. Those are requirements. We do design work and we attach the designs to issues. Those are requirements. People don't like the word requirements because they think it means regulated and it doesn't have to. Um, we're kind of down this hole where if we don't call them requirements, people don't really understand what they are, but there is a large educational gap here right now that we're trying to kind of overcome. You know, in the future, I think a lot of people want to tag design as a requirement. And that's, we've heard that from a lot of the non-regulated people because they, design is a requirement and so is the, the user story. But what we're trying to convince people of is the design should be attached to the requirement and the issues and epics should be the implementation of the requirement and the design, not like the issue is a mode of change or a mode of work. It is not the design and the requirements. And we're trying to kind of figure out where we fit in there. And it's been a little bit challenging so far, but I think we're making some great headway, so. But yes, there's definitely confusion between issues and requirements. Yeah, I think requirements almost sound like, um, like you stated, Gabe, like sub, like tasks within a, an issue or tied a little bit differently with an issue. I think that's coming from like more of the software development background. Um, yeah. I've already seen the requirement is like a long-standing thing, the behavior of a system. It's the like same thing you would write a test against like a BDD test or a unit test or whatever that says like the system behaves this way, you know, and like we've gotten a lot of feedback where uh, people also want quality management because they think GitLab doesn't do tests. Uh, so like, I don't know where that misconception comes from but i've noticed all these weird things where people call things different things based on what market they're in or their company culture and it's all like we have a lot of those same things but i just want to be clear that like you're absolutely we use correct. the right object for the right solution <laughs> right and you're absolutely correct with your idea that a requirement is something you would write tests against and you would write code to implement that is fairly what a requirement is. Um, in any way you want to phrase it, job to be done, requirement, there's lots of names for the same concept. However, traditionally in, in like what I think a lot of the methodology is right now, you write an issue to implement the requirement. We write an issue to create a feature and then the software teams go out and they write the feature based on the design that's been provided and the issue. They're looking, they're referring back to the issue. And then when it's done, they close the issue which is fine, but we don't have any long-standing record of the product except for the product itself. We've lost it because the issue is closed and it gets buried and over years it kind of goes away. Whereas when you keep requirements, you write the, the design and the requirements in the requirements section, you have an issue that says, hey, we're gonna implement this feature. You go off and implement it, but the requirements are long-lived and the tests are long-lived and the tests test the requirements and they, you will continue to run that test 
potentially for years and years because you want to make sure nobody broke your feature and you're running it against those requirements. So if you want to change the feature, you go in and change the requirements. Then you again, have that, that longstanding permanent goal of what you're actually building and the issues are in the method of change. They, they drive change into requirements. They drive change into software. They drive change into test. But the requirements themselves live on. Yeah, I also, the last thing to add to that, that might be helpful is the conversations I've had in terms of traceability. I think for regulated industries, traceability is important. But for the non-regulated, it's more compliance related where like they need to look at and verify that things are done basically and that they're compliant. So that's where like I've gotten a lot of uh, requests for doing um, gated checkpoints on issues or which is basically a set of approvals where you say who can approve this issue before it goes on this next workflow step. Um, just and because they want to be able to programmatically have traceability through the decision tree and also the output tree. Um, so that helps. No, absolutely. And that's the one thing I keep saying. And I know that people have been on calls with me have heard this a million times, but requirements and the, the testing of requirements indicates when your product is complete. It does not indicate when your product is correct. So you, your requirements define the product and the testing defines the completion of the product. Correctness has to do with the validation of the requirements. And that's a whole other process that organizations, especially in the regulated world, will go off and validate those requirements, but it has nothing to do with the software lifecycle. You built a product that meets the requirements, the product is complete, whether or not it works. If it doesn't work, that's whoever gave you the requirements' it's fault. Now, not the, <laughs> now that's slightly different in, in sort of our way of thinking. Whereas if it doesn't work, we go and figure out why, where do we went wrong in the requirements and we make those necessary updates and we flow back through our process. We write a new issue, we write an update to the test and we move forward. It's not that in conflict with the, with the original Agile manifesto where, and, and like the, basis of extreme programming where your your stakeholder writes the writes the test basically it gives you the thing to go implement based on like business and business language right uh and then the team goes and builds it and then shows it to the stakeholder and says hey here this is what you said here's how it's complete here are the tests that show that it's complete and it's it's very common i think it's just in regular like regulated industries i feel like they do the waterfall where they'll do like it in big long chunks and then I think where we're different and why Agile came to be was because people wanted to get feedback quicker. So do that in smaller chunks, basically, instead of big buckets. And so that's the only that we've created like industries behind Agile, but that's the only difference to moving into from big buckets to small chunks. <laughs> that's right. And what the regulated industries have done is they've actually done a series of mini waterfalls to make waterfall more agile. So they'll break their product into hundreds of small pieces. They'll run those individually through the waterfall method. And then they'll get their feedback faster because instead of building the whole thing, they're building just a small piece that plays into the next small piece. And they do that simply because the regulatory authorities will not allow Agile to certify for right now, I believe it's automotive, medical, and aerospace cannot certify if they don't waterfall to some degree. You have to show your design is fully reviewed after your requirements are fully reviewed, which is reviewed, you know, the design has to be reviewed prior to starting the code. Like everything has to be done in lockstep because of the certification agencies, but they're breaking those steps into smaller pieces to get a more agile flow. It's all the same thing in the end. It's just what we're naming things. And I think that's the biggest thing is you're absolutely right. Um, agile can play nicely with requirements very easily. You just have to just sort of tweak your thinking and understand that requirements isn't a bad word. I think we're at time. Over. Yeah, we are. All right. Thanks, everyone. It's a great meeting. Talk to you all later. Great session, team. <laughs> yeah, talked through a lot of things. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, y'all. Yep.